Okay, so we're talking today. Uh, we've finished our series, right? We've finished our series on the truth shall make you free. Um, and hopefully within a couple months, that'll be in book form. You'll be able to get a copy if you want. But you can watch the videos online already on YouTube or on our uh, channel, uh, our um, website. You can click on the sermons, and they're all there. But I want to talk about this, three mistakes of our prophetic church. The three greatest mistakes, I believe, that people make in a prophetic church. But in order to understand these mistakes, uh, we have to define a few terms first, okay? So first, the uh, fivefold ministry, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 11 to 13. This is why it says when Jesus ascended on high, okay, after he rose from the dead, he ascended on high and he led captives in his train and he, give, he gave gifts to men and women. Uh, he, it was he who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service, right? Not to be the big guy in this, on the block, not to have all the fame, but to prepare God's people for works of service, okay? That's to be the sign of the fivefold ministry, preparation of ministry, okay? So that the body of Christ can be built up. To, okay, number one, we'd all become, you know, like be built up, encouraged, edified is the Greek word actually. Ed, uh, and then until we all reach unity in the faith, so unity, building the body together in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, okay? So it's kind of like what's a, uh, there's a, um, stir up, build up, and grow up kind of thing, right? Uh, un attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We become like Christ, okay? Okay, so the Bible teaches that the risen Christ gave five gifts. I like to call them five graces. The Greek word is charis, which means gift or grace. I, I like to call them five graces to some people in the body of Christ. And those five graces are the apostolic grace, the prophetic grace, the, the evangelistic grace, the pastoral grace, and the teaching grace. Um, and together, these people who receive these five graces are to prepare or equip, okay, the body of Christ for service so that the whole church can come into maturity. Okay, that's the purpose of the fivefold ministry. Now, contrary to what some people teach, these five graces are all still functioning in the body of Christ today. And actually, I believe they're increasing in these last days, uh, these five graces. But we have to understand uh, these five graces are not offices or titles or positions. These five graces are empowerments, roles, and relationships, okay? They're not just they're not just an office. You don't just get a door, you know, on on your door. You get to go in this door. Oh, I'm a prophet now because I'm in the prophet's office, and then you have to re submit to me. I actually had that happen years ago. Uh, we were in this church, and this lady came in, and, and uh, uh, at the end of the service, she says, "Well, uh, that was you know pretty good message there, uh, pastor, but I'm a prophet, so you have to submit to me because I have the office office of a prophet." And I thought, I'm, I was so tempted to pull the apostle card, right? But I, but I didn't, I didn't, because it was silly what she was saying anyway. No, it's not an office where you suddenly, oh, you're a prophet now to the day you die. So everybody, I mean, your kids have to call you prophet mummy or, you know. No, no, it's not, it's not an office. It's not a title that you just go by, okay? Uh, and it's not a position that you have, okay? Because depending on where you go, some people won't even think you're anybody, right? Like, it's not a positional thing. It's an empowerment. You have the empowerment to do certain things. If you have a five-fold grace, you have the empowerment to do certain things, and you have a role to play. You, you're, you have a responsibility and a role to play. And if you're not playing that role, you're not the thing, right? You, you can't be a pastor who never pastors. You can't be a prophet who never prophesies, right? You can't be evangelist who never evangelizes, okay? And there, and there are also relationships. Paul said, I may not be an apostle to others, but I am to you. See, it's a relationship, okay? Some people in this church, I'm Pastor Dave. Some people in this church, I'm Teacher Dave. Some people in this church, I am Apostle Dave. Uh, in my home, I'm just Daddy, okay? I'm not, I'm not Apostle Daddy. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, that's right. Then, yeah. Then I lose that too, right? So, so I'm saying it, it's a relationship. An apostle is an apostle to those he apostles. 
He's not an apostle to the whole world. Get it? A pastor is a pastor to the people he pastors, not to the whole world. Okay. Okay. So we got it. For example, a, a pastor is not a person who has the office of a, or title of a, or position of a pastor. A pastor is someone who's empowered by Christ himself with a pastoral grace so that he or she can effectively fulfill the role or the function of a pastor and be able to develop healthy pastoral relationships with other people in the body of Christ where God has put them, right? So you can't just graduate from school and, just, and, and somebody labels you a pastor and you come into a local church and say, oh, I'm a pastor now. You have, to, you, you, have, you have to submit to me now as a pastor. No, what is, do you have a pastoral relationship? Have you built a pastoral relationship? Do you have the anointing to be a pastor? Are you able to fulfill the role of a pastor? Okay, and those are really important questions, okay? So anyway, so let's talk about now the, apo the apostle and the apostolic. I think I put all, all these words here for it. Yeah, an apostle is a person who is empowered by Christ with an apostolic grace so that they can effectively fulfill the role and duties of an apostle and be able to develop healthy apostolic relationships with others. Okay, the primary function of an apostle is to raise up and facilitate the ministry of the, all the fivefold graces, both inside and outside of the local church. Okay, that's your primary th primary call is to raise up other fivefold people. Okay, uh, other apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to be raising up them. I am so proud of this congregation that we've sent out many ministers all over North America. Really, I, I, I counted, and I counted uh, about 16 altogether that have actually gone into full-time ministry in other places after leaving this congregation, and, and who knows how many there really are. But that's part of what an apostolic church does, right? An apostolic church is a local church that is a healthy expression and functioning of all of the fivefold graces, and then, unfortunately, the word apostle also means sent out one, so, so they get to be sent out. So that's why... We see so many people out here sent out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Which is kind of sad to me. But anyway, uh, okay, so that's apostle, okay? So apostolic church, we have to have a healthy expression and functioning of all fivefold graces. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, uh, my strongest grace is teaching. And so many people consider this a teaching church. We are also apostolic. We're not very evangelistic. We have to work on that all the time, right? God, we need to raise up evangelists too. Okay, so now we're going to look at the prof prophet and the prophetic. That's not even our, our sermon, but we need to define some things. So let's look at a prophet is a person who's empowered by Christ with a prophetic grace so that they can effectively fulfill the role and duties of a prophet and be able to develop healthy prophetic relationships with other people. The primary function of a prophet is to accurately sense God's heart and hear God's voice. Uh, that's so important. Not just hear God's voice, but sense his heart. Because I've heard so many people, prophets, who have heard God's voice and declare it with anything but God's heart. Okay? So you have to sense God's heart for something and also hear God's voice and, and therefore clearly communicate what God has said and therefore equip the whole body of Christ to know God's heart and hear God's voice. A prophet is not just someone who prophesies. A prophet is also someone who equips the body to hear God's voice and to know God's heart. Okay? And therefore, a prophetic church is a local church that is seeking to know God's heart and hear God's voice, both for themselves and others. So that's why our service may not look like a traditional Protestant church or a traditional Catholic traditional Catholic church, or whatever, because we're trying as much as possible to be led by the Spirit in our service. Now, often it does look the same, but we're always kind of, you know, one antenna is in the Word, and the other one antenna is on the Spirit trying to, you know, God, what do you want to do next here, right? And be available to do that, okay? So that's, those are our definitions. Now we want to get into three key mistakes of a prophetic church, right? We, we want to be a prophetic church. We want to... Um, we want to be a, a fivefold church, but including a prophetic church, we want to, we desire to allow the Holy Spirit to move in our gatherings, uh, so that we can know God's heart and hear God's voice, okay, and communicate God's heart and God's voice to other people. That's why we have blessing line at the end, and that's why even uh, as we're sending out Alyssa, there was some prophetic words that went on. We want to hear God's voice and know God's heart, okay. However, I've noticed that there are three uh, key uh, mistakes 
that we can make and, 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 and do make oh, uh, from time to time uh, as, as, as we attempt to be a prophetic church. A and now the good news is that all three mistakes can be so easily corrected. All we have to do is be aware of them and correct them. So here's the three mistakes. The first mistake, uh, symbolism. What do I mean by that? It's mistakes in interpreting prophetic symbolism. Mistakes in interpreting prophetic symbolism. Matthew chapter 13, verses 37 to 39. G uh, Jesus had talk, talk the uh, taught the parable uh, of, of the seed, okay? And, and, and Jesus answered, he's interpreting his own parable because he didn't get it. He said, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field where the seed was sown is the world. And the good seed stands for the sons of of the kingdom, okay? Jesus is the sower. The, 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 the sons of the kingdom are the good seed, and the weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows the evil seeds or the, the, uh, the weeds is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the ages, and the harvesters are the angels. So Jesus explained the parable. What's my point in this, though, is that Jesus often used symbolism. Like so many times in the Bible, he used symbolism in his teachings to communicate truth. And God often uses symbolism in his messages to communicate to us prophetically. And this is so important to understand that, that, that almost all prophetic language, okay, almost all prophetic language and all prophetic vision includes a lot of symbolism, pictures, Okay, representations. And so that brings us to our first mistake. Our first mistake is in misinterpreting those prophetic symbols. Okay, for example, um, a rainbow usually symbolizes a promise of God, right? But it could also just symbolize hope. You know, God may just give you a rainbow and just say, keep going. It's okay. Keep going. Keep going. It's just a symbol of hope. It certainly was during COVID, wasn't it? It was a symbol of hope that things were going to get better. Okay, leaven usually symbolizes the, the nature of sin, but in a couple times it actually symbolizes the influence, uh, 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 the influential nature of the kingdom of God. Okay, so leaven is not sin, leaven is influence, and usually negative influence, but a couple times positive influence. We have to understand symbolism is in the context of what God's trying to say. A new car can symbolize, ooh, you're going to get a new car. But a new car could also just symbolize that you're going to go on a trip in the f near future. And that's why it's a new car versus an old car. Okay? So, so there are different symbols. They mean different things. So what I'm getting at is often what we see is not really what God's trying to tell us. Okay? We have to see the symbol and, and understand what it means. Okay? Uh, here, here's a crazy example, but it's still a valid example. If, we, if, we, if we're asked, for whatever reason, to perform a funeral service, and we really want to do a good job, so we're praying, God, what, what do you want to show me about that funeral service? And suddenly, you just see a whole bunch of balloons, okay? I do not believe that that, that means that God wants you to blow up 200 balloons and bounce them around during the funeral service. I do not believe that, okay? But what God is most likely saying is that God wants the service to be more of a celebrative, celebrative uh, nature than a grieving uh, kind of a, you know, a, a grieving nature over the death of the person who died. He wants it to be more like a celebration of life than a grieving over the death. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so the balloons don't represent balloons. They represent a flavor of the atmosphere or whatever, okay? You know, if we have a vision of a dark a dark cloud over a person, and, I, and I've seen this, uh, if you have a vision of a dark cloud hanging over a person's head, yeah, it could be that there's demonic oppression over that person that needs to be broken, but it could also be that the person has just heard some really bad news, and they just need to be encouraged. And, and, you know, and if, they, if they've just heard bad news and they need to be encouraged, and you go up to them and say, I oh, see a dark cloud overhead, come out in Jesus' name. And they go, well, I sure wish that bad news would come out in Jesus' name, but really, what I really need is an encouragement. Okay? So that's the trick of, of, of the images that God gives us. And I really believe, what, what's the Bible say? Like, maybe we need to take a step here. Or, that in the last days, 
God will pour out his spirit in all flesh. And it says that we will see, uh, dream dreams and see visions. Okay? We will. And if it's the last days, everybody's telling me it's the last days. I don't know if it's the last days or not. But if it is the last days, we should expect to see a lot more dreams and a lot more visions. Now, the cool thing is, in the Middle East right now, Muslims are coming to Christ because they're seeing visions and dreaming dreams. It's really cool. Okay. So, but God's also doing it here. Okay. So, we have to learn to avoid these three mistakes. Okay. So, um, okay. So, if we see, say, say we're walking along and all of a sudden we see, uh, I don't know, a, a snake in front of a person. Oh, what's that? Um, obviously, that's a demon. Well, it could be. Uh, it could also be that the this, this snake, I didn't, I didn't realize this since I started studying, uh, the symbol of a snake is also, you know how it sheds its old skin? Uh, a snake is also a symbol of transformation to newness of life. And th there's a big difference between demonized versus being transformed by the Spirit of God. Again, we have to discern, okay? And, and actually, if, if the snake you see is actually rising up a bit, well, what is that? Well, the snake's going to grab me. No, according to John chapter 3, a snake rising up is a symbol of Jesus being risen from the grave, just like the snake was raised up in the wilderness. It's a sign of, 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 of new life. It's a sign of salvation. It's a sign uh, that maybe the person has an evangelistic call in their life. See, so we can't just take a single image and immediately assume what it means, okay? There's no book. Well, there is, unfortunately. There's a lot of book, dictionary books, on what the different symbols mean. Problem is, most of them will lead people astray because the symbols change based on the context of what God's trying to say, okay? And that's so important to understand. So, anyway, you have to be very, very careful when we see symbols, okay? Uh, be very careful and not just run with the symbol, what it means to you. Maybe God, maybe that symbol is not for you at all. Maybe it's for the other person. And what a symbol means to me is usually a lot different than what a symbol means to somebody else, okay? So the correction. Let's talk about correction now. If we have trouble misinterpreting prophetic symbols, how do we respond to this symbolic uh, uh, communication from God? Well, number one, just seek clarification. Like, just don't run with it, right? Never act in haste when you have a, a sim when God gives you a prophetic vision or a symbol, okay? Take the time. Say, Lord, what are you trying to say here? Like, get, they get rid of my understanding. What are you trying to say in this situation? You know, like, people always come to me <laughs> when they have a dream. Say, Pastor Dave, what's this dream mean? And I go, well, your first mistake is asking me because uh, I have my own set of understanding of what different symbols mean. So you go to somebody that is much better. Uh, Sandy, Pastor Sandy is much better at interpreting prophetic symbols. Nancy Lowe is really good at uh, interpreting prophetic symbols too uh, and there's a few others I know that go to them okay because if I yeah, I'll probably lead you astray if you just want to know my interpretation okay so number one seek more clarification discover exactly what God wants you to understand by that symbol that you see in that prophetic vision or that dream and even find out if God wants you to understand it all maybe he doesn't want you to know what that symbol means because it's not for you maybe that is for somebody else and never share or never, you know, just assume the meaning of a symbol without getting a clear word from the Lord, okay? Just really trying to clarify that. Um, also, if you're going to share that with somebody else, if in case that dream or that vision, whatever, is for somebody else, only share exactly what you saw or what God said, okay? Uh, it's, it's usually not our job to interpret the symbols if we're supposed to share it with somebody else. In fact, because the symbol is meant for the other person, they're the best one to interpret the symbol, right? Based upon their background, their life experiences, it may mean something completely different to them, okay? Uh, it's none of our business in many, in many cases what that symbol actually means. It, it's, it, the message was not for us. Um, and I, I want to keep talking about the postal worker. Um, the, a person who receives a prophetic word, a prophetic message, an image, or vision is all like a postal worker, right, or a courier. Um, the, the job of the postal worker is not to shake the box and try to figure out what's inside the box, okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The job of the postal worker is not to hold the letter up to the light and see what's inside the letter, right? That's not the job of the postal worker. The postal worker's job is only 
to present that message, that gift, that m piece of mail to the other person and then let go. Okay, that's the job of, 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 of a prophetic person if the word is for somebody else. Okay, and then just pray for them if you want. Trust God. Trust that, that God will give them the right interpretation of that prophetic word. So when it comes to receiving a prophetic image for another person, just share it with them and leave it up to them on how to best interpret that it okay don't try to lay your own interpretation on it that has really misled a lot of people I, I even had somebody I, I said a prophetic word about it was I think it was a even a corrective word about just being careful of the relationship they were developing ten years later it came to me I said we're married because of you because of that prophetic word you gave I go what yeah you said we're supposed to develop this relationship together so we did I went that's not what I said. So w the, the emphasis was on be careful. <laughs> anyway, they got married. They had absolute blissful joy for three years. And then not so much. Now they're divorced. Because they weren't careful. Anyway. Be very careful about misinterpreting symbols. Okay, that's a big mistake in so many uh, prophetic churches. Number two, idols. What on earth? Idols? There's no idol. Come on, there's no idols in here. There used to be that weird thing on the wall there. Remember that? We got, that's gone now. Right. But what I mean, it says mistakes that are made due to the idols in our hearts. Okay. Makes that are made due to the idols in our hearts. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 4. This is a pretty scary verse, actually. Therefore, it says uh, to the prophet, speak to them. Ezekiel, speak to them and say, uh, tell them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. When any Israelite sets up idols in their heart, right, idols in his heart, first, idols always start in a heart, okay, and puts a stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him myself in keeping with his great idolatry. God basically says, if you allow an idol to be set up in your heart, my word to you will be in line with your idol. That's not good. That's terrible. <laughs> so what is an idol in this context? An idol is anything we elevate above God. Doesn't that be a physical thing, you know, a squeegee toy or whatever, idol. And anything we set up above God, okay? Uh, and as being more important than God and, and God's will. And so an idol, an idol in our heart could be any strong desire for something, such as a certain person or a certain uh, job or a certain object or a certain success or a certain relationship. Those can all be idols. And I think even the world understands that. And that's why we have American Idol. Okay, and if any of these things, any desires you have are set up above God, they become an idol, and it will affect your ability to hear God's voice clearly. Okay, it'll affect your ability to hear what God's really saying. And, and instead of hearing what God wants to say, Either we will misinterpret because of the idol in our heart, or God will be forced to speak in line with the idol that we've set up above him. That's what that's saying. So that's, so what, okay, what's our second mistake? The second mistake we can make as a prophetic person is that we add our own agenda to a prophetic word. We add our own agenda to a prophetic word, okay? Uh, what I mean by that, for example, if the other person uh, it, or I should say it this way, if we really want the other person to have a certain job, it may influence us to prophesy they're going to get that job, even though that's not what God said. Okay? Like it's, it's really, we have to be so careful if we're going to speak on behalf of God. If a person gets a strong sickness, but we really want them to live, you know, God's will is for them to live, but that doesn't mean everyone's going to live. Everyone's going to live just because God wants them to live. What, really? Well, the Bible says God wants all to be saved, but not everybody gets saved. 
God's will is not always done. That's why Matthew says, pray this way. Pray that God's kingdom would come and God's will would be done because often God's will is not done, okay? So we may even know that God's will is for that person to live. And so therefore, we, they get sick. And so we prophesy, thou shalt live and not die. Well, I know that's God's will, but that's not me. that wasn't what God said to you, okay? Sometimes it is, but usually it's not, okay? And if we make that prophetic promise, then maybe say, oh, I'm a, if I'm going to live and not die, I'll get rid of all medi medication, I'll stop my treatments, I'll do whatever, and then suddenly they get worse, and they say, but God said, no, 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 that w wannabe prophet said, um, and you misled them. Maybe what they really needed was to stay on their treatment and just rested in the Lord's presence and the healing would have come that way. But your word actually misled them. In other cases, sometimes people just die. They really do. It's sad, but sometimes people really just die. And to make a prophetic promise or make a promise for a person that with a prophetic uh, edge to it, when it's not what God said, we can give them false hope. We can, we can mislead them, okay? Or, here's another one, if a certain person has a certain attitude or character flaw, that may influence us to prophesy over them that God wants them to deal with that specific character flaw, even if that's not what God said. Now, obviously, God does want them to deal with that character flaw, but if God's not saying it at that moment, you don't speak it. See, because I, I teach people all the time, if you do a list of 1 to 10, and number one is maybe, I don't know, smoking or drinking or addictions. And maybe down at 10 is ungratefulness and unthankfulness. And we say, okay, thus saith Lord, you need to deal with your smoking and your drinking and whatever. And, 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 but, may, but see, God always has the same order. or He has the same list, right? God has the same list, but he usually flips it. And so number one for God is your stinky attitudes. Number one with God is maybe ungratefulness or, or lack of thankfulness because that's going to release your heart of bitterness so you'll be able to work on those addictions, right? Okay, so, so often we're tempted to add to a prophetic word what we desire to see in that person change. And we can't do that if God didn't say it, okay? Um, you know, all of our good hopes and our dreams for other people can actually become idols in our heart. You can so love, and hopefully you do so love other people, that you have this intense love for other people. But if that becomes an idol in your heart in terms of wanting them to see, see them prosper in a certain area, it will actually distort your ability to hear God's voice concerning the other person. Okay? And, and, and the same, at the same time, all of our frustrations about other people can actually become idols in our heart also. And they can influence to hear things about the other person that God really doesn't want them to do at this point, okay? So that's the second mistake. You know, allowing idols in our heart concerning other people, both positive ones and negative ones. So how do we, what's the correction here? Well, number one, remove the idols, okay? Whenever we get a word for the other person, I, and I try to do this as much as I can, whenever I hear a word from another person, first thing I say, God, was that you? Or is that being filtered through an idol or a desire I have for that person? And it's my own aspirations, not God's will. Okay? So we stop. We cleanse our heart of any idols related to the person. And then we ask God, say, God, would you speak again? And see what he says the second time. And it may be different than the first time. Because we heard wrong the first time. We have to ask the Lord to remove all of our personal agendas for the other person, both negative and positive, right? We've got to rid of all those agendas. And then only share the pure word that God has given us, free from all of our hopes and aspirations, and free from all of our criticisms and all of our judgments. You know, one of the biggest things I had to learn uh, in my early years as a prophetic person is that, you know, as a pastor, I know a lot of things about people. They, you know, the stuff they tell me. And then I get a word from him. I go, oh, God, you've got to be mistaken because do you, they, do you really know that person, God? They, do you really know who that person? And, and God says, hey, that's what I want to say to them. I know what you want to say, Dave, but that's what I want to say to them. And you have to only share what God says, okay? Okay. And again, share the clear word. Um, only share the clear word, not the filtered word, not the word with anything taken away or anything added that might be out of our flesh or out of the idol that we have in our heart. 
Um, even if we know things about people, we don't add it unless God says to add it, right? Okay. So for example, if, if someone is going to get married and, and God says, share with them, uh, it's going to be a great sunny day. I know the weather forecasts are bad, but don't worry. It's going to be a good day. Maybe that's what all God says. It's going to be a sunny day. So we share that. But if we say, you know what? It's going to be a sunny day, and you're just going to have the best marriage ever. It's going to be awesome. And then they wonder why three months into the marriage they have a conflict. But that guy said it was going to be awesome. Well, no, you went too far. Just, uh, just out of interest, like, I've always wanted to ask this question. Why not today? Has anyone in their lives who's ever been married ever experienced a conflict-free marriage? No conflicts at all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, because conflict's not a bad thing. So don't, don't prophesy you're not going to have any conflict. It's not, it's, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Okay. Okay. Okay, back to the postal worker. Um, we must only give them the package that's personally addressed to them. Okay? We don't give them any other packages that maybe aren't addressed. Oh, I got some extra ones here. There's no address on. You have those ones too. No, you don't do that. And you certainly don't give them any packages that are addressed to other people, but you think they can use it better. Right? You don't do that. Right? Oh, here's like five from Amazon I think you could use. Here, have them too. No, you don't do that. You only give them the word that is just for them, the message that is just for them. And so if the package isn't personally addressed to them, don't give it to them, even if you think it can be a benefit to them, okay? So when we get, receive, did I put that there? Summary. When we receive a prophetic word for another person, we only give what the Lord says to us. We don't add anything else to it, either of a positive or negative nature okay so so important if we're going to be a, a healthy prophetic church number three control okay what's that talking about these are mistakes due to a temptation to control other people okay matthew 20 verses 25 and 26 jesus called them together and said you know that the rulers of the gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them not so with you, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And then the uh, Apostle Paul goes on and adds in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith that you stand firm. So even in terms of a person's spiritual life, their, their, their discipleship, you don't lord it over other people, Okay. So Jesus said that the Gentiles deal with people by lording it over them. They try to control them and tell them what to do and put pressure on them to do what they, they want, to get them to obey. And Jesus went, you know, um, Jesus went on and said, no, that's not the way that we as Christians deal with people. And the Apostle Paul went on to clarify. He said, you know, we are not to lord it over anyone else's faith. If they're messing up, they're responsible Okay, we don't lord it over them. We don't try to control people. We only work with them for their joy. Okay, so even if we know that someone is going to do something really foolish, we resist the temptation to try to control them. Okay, we warn them if God allows us to do that, but we never try to control them. Okay. So that leads us to our third mistake here. And, and it's that as a prophetic person, we may feel the need or even the right, depending on our relationship with the person, to make the receiver personally accountable, accountable to, to us for the prophetic word that we give them, right? I gave you a prophetic word. Check up on you. How are you doing with that? Did you do what it said? If we get a word for someone that they should read the Bible every day, we may feel that we have the right to check up on them every day and say, did you read it today yet? Did you read it today yet? You don't have that right. Okay. It was God's word to them. If we get a word that a person should forgive a certain person, we may feel the responsibility to make sure that they do forgive and, 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 and even bother them until they do. Well, I can promise you, if you bother someone, hassle someone until they forgive someone, it's not going to be very heartfelt, is it? 
okay. It's going to be, well, okay, okay, I forgive you. It's like, we see that with kids all the time. Kids, say you're sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> they, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that. <laughs> I, think I, I think I've done that. <laughs> um, and and uh, Jesus and Paul said, no, that's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. That's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. We tell people to take personal responsibility for their own freedom that we talked about in the last series and for their own spiritual maturity. They have to take personal responsibility. So they build true maturity in their lives. It's not maturity if your every move is controlled by another person. If your day is ordered by another person, that's not mature growth. That's just control. Okay. So how do we correct this? Okay. How do we correct the temptation to want to control other people, even if we love them, right? Sometimes the need to control comes out of a, a, a real love for people. And that's when it gets really tricky. So number one, w- whenever we... Uh, Give a prophetic word. Once we share the prophetic word, we need to release the word, and then we release the person. What does that mean? It means that we share the prophetic word, and then we let go of that word. Release it to them, and we take our hands off that word. It's not our word. Okay, it's not our word anymore. We've passed it on. But then we also release the person from any sense of obligation we feel they should have to us, unless they request it. You know, if they come up, if you give a word and say, wow, I really want to do that, could you maybe call me once a week and say I'm going to do in that area? Then it's okay. But if they don't ask you, you don't say, well, you know what I really think you need is you need me to call you every week and check up on you. And at first they'll think that's a good idea until you call every week and check up on them. They go, I'm feeling pressure. I'm feeling controlled here. Okay. Second thing we do, once we give them the mail, once we give them the word, we pray for them. You know, what does the Bible say? Apostle Paul said, it said, we work with them for their joy. And one of the ways we can always work with someone is we pray for them. When Helen was down in uh, Belize, we were working with her every day from here because we were praying for her. We were blessing her, praying for protection and health and God's favor and divine connections. And God did the work. And, we, and, and it was for her joy, right? But we didn't call her up and say, you need to talk to this person, you need to talk to that person. And <laughs> Although you wouldn't answer anyway, right? Because you... <laughs> How do we work with people for their joy? We pray for them, that God would work in their lives. And second, we refuse to go any further unless they ask for help. Whether it means maybe to be their accountability partner, or maybe it just means that, hey, could you just share with me some of your wisdom in going through that situation? Like we're going to, in, in September, we're going to get some wisdom from Claude on how he started his business, and we're going to learn from that, right? But Claude has never come up to me and said, Pastor Dave, you have this ministry called Entrenet. You better listen to me because I know exactly how to start a business. He never said that because he understands, right? It's the whiteness of the hair, I guess. <laughs> The shininess there. <laughs> I, I'm so Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Well, I am concerned because so many times today I find myself going, oh, no, and I find my hair receding because I'm going so much, but no. <laughs> okay, so we may be asked to help people work through an issue in their lives but we never force anything on them. That's control. Okay, back to our postal worker. Um, Once we've delivered the package, we don't go back to them the next day and see if they've opened the package we gave them. I gave you a big package yesterday. Did you open it yet? It's not our job, right? Or we don't demand, well, I saw I gave you a bill yesterday in the mail. Did you pay that bill yet? We don't do that. Or we saw a bank statement. We don't go to them and say, did you call the bank concerning that bank statement you got? Right? Postal workers don't do that. Do you understand that? You get, they will get into a lot of trouble if they do that. And you will get into a lot of trouble if you try to follow up on someone to that degree. Because that's control. That's intrusion into their personal lives. And that's taking personal responsibility as yours that's only theirs. It's not our job as a postal worker. Our job as a prophetic person, as a postal worker, is just deliver the mail and let go. Okay. 
So when it comes to this issue of control, when we receive a prophetic word for another person, we share with the person, and then we let go of any sense of responsibility for the word. Instead, we let the receiver take their own responsibility because that's how people mature. If they ask you, fine, but if they don't ask you, you release it. Okay. So we're getting, yeah, we're there. In these last days, um, you know, in the last days, right, people dream dreams, see visions, okay? In these last days, God is restoring his church really to a former glory, but it's even going to be more glorious than ever. It really is. I really believe that. But part of this glory restoration is restoring the fivefold graces of God, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, okay? A and uh, as a result, God is raising up uh, more apostolic and prophetic churches around the world, even denominations that are resisting them, like a certain Southern Baptist, <laughs> uh, oops, a certain denomination <laughs> in the South <laughs> was resisting the apostolic movement, and suddenly they turn around and they have an apostle in their midst with a church of 25,000. You know, what happened here? No, no, you can't do that. Because there's no such thing as a... No, there is. Okay. Let's just accept the fact. Okay. So God is raising up apostolic and prophetic churches. And we need, our, we need to do our best to cooperate with God. Okay. And be formed into that prophetic church. Here. And it's all just about hearing God's voice. My sheep know my voice. Oh, okay. So we already can do it. But we need to learn how to fine tune. Okay, the signal's coming, but are you tuned into the right frequency today? Okay, it's, you know, it's there, right? So you, it's, you, and here's the thing. So many Christians believe they can tune into the Satan's frequency. You know, Satan's talking to me all the time. He's criticizing me and re condemning me. Well, just ch you know, change the station. <laughs> like, demon 105. <laughs> no, no, tune into Holy Spirit 100. Or Holy Spirit 03 is even better. Yeah? Like, tune into the right state. You can hear your spiritual beings. You can hear God's voice. Tune into the right station. And we can help you do that. That's our job, to equip the saints for works of ministry. So, and we quickly correct the mistakes that every prophetic church will make. Look at that. I'm frozen now. I'm yeah. And... Are we frozen? <laughs> Isn't that something? Okay. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Three, three mistakes. Guard against misinterpreting prophetic symbols. Do whatever you can to resist the temptation to lay an interpretation on a symbol before asking God because it will save you a lot of pa heart pain or, and misunderstanding and misperception. Number two, remove all idols in your heart if you're going to minister to others any idol, both the positive and the negative ones, and, and, or both the negative and the positive ones, because a lot of us have positive idols, not negative ones, but they're still going to confuse the words of God. And number three, resist all temptation to control, even if you love the other person. You still help them to take their own responsibility. So what are we going to do? Let's stand together. Let's, God help us to mature as a prophetic church. Help us to be a mature prophetic church that correctly ministers prophecy in a way that liberates other people into freedom in Christ. We've been singing about that. We've been praying over that today. We've been prophesying that. Let's pray that. And then when you get home, ask God to help you become more sensitive to his voice. We have online courses you can take on that topic. You, there's great things you can, uh, we have great resources. Be willing to share with others whatever he wants you to share, okay? Let's do that. Let's go back to uh, there. Whoops. Go back there. Lord, we just put our hand on our heart right now. We say, God, we want to be those that hear your voice clearly and know your heart. God, know your voice and know your heart. Yeah, hear your voice and know your heart. That's what a prophetic person is. Someone that hears your voice and knows your heart. Help us that we as a church would become we would excel at doing those two things. But then as a result, God, help us by your grace to correctly minister prophecy in a way that liberates other people, never condemns, never puts down, never casts fear into a person's heart, never casts uh, condemnation into a person's heart, never casts judgment into a person's heart. But Lord, all, always releases a person to greater levels of freedom, God, because that that's what your word's for, 1 Corinthians 14. 
word of God to, to, to encourage, edify, and comfort. Encourage, edify, and comfort, God. Help us to, to be those that hear your voice and know your heart, that we would be those who encourage, edify, and comfort so that they would become freer after we pray for them, after we minister to them, after we love on them than before. Lord, help us to have the ministry of freedom. Yeah, help us to minister freedom wherever we go. We pray that in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen.